pleasure and then also an honor to welcome here and introduce you Professor Francesco Rentocchini. For those of you who do not know him yet, Francesco is currently associate professor uh, Svetlana, I can't, I can't hear the speaker. It, it is, this is your problem, Svetlana, because I think that everybody can hear. Francesco, you can hear me, correct? Yeah. yeah. So, um, unfortunately, Svetlana, I think your is your problem. So, I was saying that Francesco is currently associate professor in innovation with the Department of Economics, Management, and Quantitative Methods at the University uh, of Milan, and also visiting research fellow. Uh, within Southampton Business School at the University of Southampton. It is also a pleasure uh, to tell you that Francesco is about to move to JRC of Seville very soon. So I think this is official. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm glad that, that a couple of uh, colleagues from the JRC are here. That they want to test if you are really a good guy. There. <laughs> so that, that's my finish, that's Sarah. Sarah. So, Francesco is going to join the Jersey of Civil uh, soon. I don't know when exactly, but this is another, another important position that uh, Francesco is going to fill uh, pretty soon. Uh, and if I can add, uh, Francesco has also recently joined uh, the teaching committee of our PhD program in regional science and in economic geography. And we are very, very uh, happy and honor uh, to have in, in our in our teaching committee. Um, Francesco, needless to say, has got an established research record in the area uh, of economics of innovation, which is also uh, in in basically the topic of this today presentation. Uh, his research interests, more specifically within the domain of economics of innovation, include. Uh, innovation in high-tech industry, academic entrepreneurship, university industry collaboration, and open innovation and open data, which you might have seen is actually uh, the topic, uh, although uh, in, in a particular, uh, basically, relationship with entrepreneurship, but it's, it's the topic of this today talk. Uh, his articles, you might have read them, have appeared uh, and quite outstanding international journal like research policy and that's a corporate change international journal that's organizations so and so forth right is associate editor of european management review and and he's been guest editor uh, in a number of uh, of, of special issues he contributed to several research projects uh, both at the national and international level and he has also enjoyed research periods abroad in various international research centers, among which uh, Ingenio in Spain. I've seen that there's both Davide and Pablo here. <laughs> so it's a sort of collection of friends, Francesca, for you, right? So uh, this is a yeah, short presentation uh, of Francesca. We are very glad to have you here. So before starting the webby, let me remind you some rules that, as usual, are necessary for an effective working of a webinar. Uh, first of all, I would kindly ask you to mute your mic uh, and, and turn your camera off, at least for the time being. Uh, you could eventually switch them on lately when we would like to intervene, but in order to avoid, you know, background noise, I would kindly ask you uh, to turn off both your mic and, and camera. Um, in terms of rules of the game, let me tell you that, as usual, we have planned to have two kinds of intervention. Uh, I'm going to take spotlight question of clarification during the talk. The only thing that you need to do is, uh, if you are here in the Google Meet, write me a line in the chat and tell me that you, you would like to intervene or if you'd like to pose a question. Uh, for those that are in our YouTube channel, uh, Daniele will, can, will will copy and paste the question in the chat, but I, I will moderate and, uh, the question that I'm going to receive uh, in the chat. Uh, at the end of Francesco talk, we're going to have a virtual coffee break, uh, five, six minutes just to, you know, relax a little bit. Uh, and after this short virtual coffee break, 
we're going to have uh, a, a more extended discussion among us. So I'm going to, again, take a longer question this time. Uh, as usual, as, as I tell you before, just drop me a line in the chat and I will please do leave you the word so that you can pose your question yourself uh, to Francesco. Okay. Uh, an important uh, point before le uh, uh, letting you the word, Francesco, is that um i would like to inform everybody that uh, we uh, we are about to start recording uh the webinar because we plan to disseminate uh, the recordings of, of a webby in our website and in our social accounts as uh, as i'm sure you know in order to proceed to proceed further with that uh we would need your consensus to record and disseminate your presence and eventual intervention. Now, operationally, uh, having a written consensus from each and everybody of you would be quite difficult. I would therefore ask you to report me if some of you is against this. Okay, so if someone and someone in the audience does not want that and is against recording or require us to protect their privacy in doing that, please let me know. Okay. Having done that, uh, I apologize for not this really short intro and I leave the, the virtual floor uh, to, to Francesco. Francesco, please, uh, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Sandro. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so I can also start sharing my um, presentation. Just tell me if you have any problems here. Um, um, can see that? We can see you, Francesco. Yeah, I can see the the first slide of your presentation with Fantastic. title and authors. So. All right. So uh, before I begin, um, let me you know thank uh, the organizing committee. I mean, for having me here today and for giving me like, the, the possibility to to be here today to introduce myself and my and my research. Um, and also, I would like you know, to take the opportunity to thank everyone who connected, uh, both old friends and former colleagues, and also new people that I don't know. Thanks very much, you know, for being here today. Um, so, um, what I'm gonna talk about today is um, this paper that we have with a number of former colleagues at the University of Southampton. This is, you know, part of, you know a um, research project that I started um, at the time when I was employed at the University of Southampton. Uh, as you have probably noticed, the title is a bit bold, uh, The Wealth of Open Data Nations. I hope that my presentation will keep up with expectations to this respect. Um, before I start, uh, let me just uh, talk uh, a little bit about the team. Uh, I know, I mean, I, po I apologize in advance uh, because I know that, you know, uh, the type of, you know, gender diversity here is, is very, very, very low. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the team that, you know, we assemble to work on this work. And I think there is another type of diversity uh, which is quite relevant in this work that comes from uh, what we uh, have done uh, by bringing together different experiences on this project. Um, this is basically um, a work that I've carried out with Franz Uber and Thomas Wainwright, who were like former colleagues of mine at the University of Southampton, uh, and who are uh, basically management economic scholars, like myself, and then Alan Ponte, who was at the time a PhD student at a PhD in web science, so a computer scientist. And, you know, uh, there is a reason for that, because actually we are dealing with a topic that is the one of open government data, which ha is quite popular within the computer and science community. And the, at the University of Southampton at the time, we were trying like to work in from an interdisciplinary point of view with a collaboration between the Southampton Business School, where Franz, uh, Thomas and myself were based, and uh, Alan, who was at the Web Science Institute at the time. Alan is now a lecturer at the University of uh, Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. Um, having said that, you know, this is the overall agenda. Uh, so the timeline that I will follow uh, for, for my presentation. So I will start with one slide to give you like the key takeaways, the, the, the key results from, uh, from the work that we have carried out so far. Uh, then I will 
uh, spend uh, um, a little bit of time to uh, talk about, you know, the general, you know, background, so the overall, you know, theoretical framework I'm, we are going um, to employ, just to be sure that we are on the same page. Uh, for some of you, probably this is going to be a bit boring because we already know these things, but at the same time, I want, you know, other people who are not like experts or who have not worked on economics of innovation uh, to uh, be aware of, you know, what is uh, our uh, overall approach and theoretical background here. Uh, then I'm going to introduce you to uh, the concept of open data by providing you general definition. I will talk about the, um, the possible benefits that open data are expected to bring to society overall. I will do a very brief literature review, just one slide. There are very few academic works in social sciences on open, open government data. Uh, I will set forward, you know, our, our two main research questions and then I will dig deeper into, you know, the empirical, you know, um, work that we have done uh, and the main results that we obtained. Um, we have, you know, a, a number of robustness checks that we have carried out. I will just focus on one related to instrumental variable estimation. Uh, and then I will conclude briefly. So um, let me start with, you know, by the end. So key takeaways. Uh, so the take-home messages is a bit of a weird title, this one, probably, because, you know, you're already home, so there's nothing to take home for you. But anyway, um, what we actually do here is that we are interested in to investigate the extent to which publishing uh, data by governments uh, openly is related to entrepreneurship, and I would say, if I want to be more precise, digital entrepreneurship. And this is uh, uh, done at the country level mainly for a number of reasons that I will explain, you know, soon enough. Uh, what we do here is basically we follow a nascent and academic interest, mainly from computer science, um, as well as a number of um, claims from policymakers and, you know, uh, enthusiasts on, uh, on open data, and in particular governments and uh, open data advocates. Uh, what we actually find, um, uh, so our main, core main results, um, it's actually that we find some evidence that actually uh, releasing uh, data by government as open seems to be positively related to new firm creation, in particular to um, new um, digital companies, um, and that this relationship is mainly driven by uh, differences across countries rather than changes um, changes through time within country, and this is this probably also an artifact of the database that we are available. It is a, a short panel, and I will go to that, you know, when I talk about the data itself, and that government quality positively contributes to uh, this relationship. So, having said that, what is our general, you know, background, theoretical background that we follow? Uh, what we actually do here is that uh, we, we start from recognizing the fact that, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the, the contribution of Schumpeter to e economic thought with these two main, like, contributions, you know, theory of economic development and capitalism, socialism, and democracy. And the, by the work of Schumpeter, different streams of the literature was focused on different uh, topics. One is the importance of innovation and technological change, and there's been, you know, huge development. You know, I know that there are a lot of people um, that are listening today, you know, uh, feel themselves a part of what has been, have been called, for example, by Bart Perspag and the Invisible College of Innovation Studies. So uh, for them, these going to be probably a bit boring, what I'm, I'm going to tell, you know, in the, in the next few seconds. But anyway, um, the, the evolution of economics, uh, as you know, um, basically, it has been like an, a formalization of you know uh, the, the important role that innovation has for economic growth, and you know later on these, uh, and later on this this has been incorporated more uh, even more formally within like mainstream theory through endogenous innovation growth theory, and there has been you know a huge uh, stream of the literature uh, that has worked on. on economics of innovation, so the importance of innovation for economic growth and development. Uh, at the same time, in the work of Schumpeter, one important thing that all, always stands out is the, the relevant, the, 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 the importance of entrepreneurship at, and of the entrepreneur. 
Um, there has been like you know interesting work you know um, published by Agadom on ICC and um, industrial and corporate change, which has shown that actually entrepreneurship is not only important in the first work of Schumpeter, theory of economic development, but also later on in in all his work overall. And you know, to this respect, uh, there has been you know a huge advancement in this literature, which has linked, for example, the role of knowledge of innovation, in particular that of you know the localization of innovation, with the theory of uh, knowledge below uh, the knowledge below the theory of entrepreneurship, and how you know the localization of uh, knowledge is important for the recognition of entrepreneurial opportunities. And that, you know, another, another important, uh, I think, development in entrepreneurship refers instead to the fact that uh, it's not only important to look at entrepreneurship at the local, at the micro level, but also the macro level becomes uh, quite important because uh, there are, you know, a number of dimensions which relates, for example, to the importance of national policies, resource distribution mechanisms, uh, social norms that you know are relevant at the at the macro country level, and so in, from this point of view, for example, the recent work on national systems of entrepreneurship shows how entrepreneurship and innovation interact heavily with in institutions. So, if I want to um, give you in one sentence, you know, um, the, the the idea of you know the overall approach that we take. Uh, this is basically a paper at the crossroad of economics innovation and entrepreneurship with flavors of institutional economics. Um, um, it is clear that, and so obviously, um, an important change and transformation that happened you know, in recent decades, one of the most important ones has been like digital transformation. Uh, which means that um, digitization and the internet brought tremendous change both to society and to economies as a whole. You can think about, you know, the, the huge investment, the changes that happen in, in infrastructures, standards, recently the importance, you know, uh, of platforms. And this has changed, you know, businesses and also economies uh, overall. Um, more recently, you know, uh, the importance has moved probably to uh, the, the relevance of user-generated content and the rise of the big five, so the five, you know, largest companies and more, more, most profitable at the, um, at the world level. Of course, this has also raised important threats uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the demand of skills, you know, uh, uh, it, it has affected, you know, the labor market in terms of unemployment, and it is a given also, you know, uh, has brought also changes to other other things that you know relate to populism, fake news, etc. So um, my my our in main interest here, um, as you've seen from our title, is about data. And you know one thing that is is quite clear from you know the recent literature is that intangible assets are really relevant ingredients for economic growth and productivity gains. And you can think about you know the first waves of the ICT revolution, for example, as you know uh, the importance of the investment in intangible assets. So think about the investment in computer, in software, the complementary organizational investment, and this meant for you know, you know the, the the workplace. Uh, and more recently, you can think about you know new waves of uh, innovation and technological change, which relate, for example, to key enabling technologies, uh, machine learning algorithms, industry 4.0 technologies, and medical technologies as well, which will become certainly you know, very, very important in, um, after the, in the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, what, one thing that um, basically all of these uh, technologies share is, is probably, and, 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 and that is becoming increasingly important, is the central part played by data in that. Uh, and this raises uh, both academic and policy relevant issues. If you think about that, you know, I don't want to go into the details of that. We can have a discussion at the end if someone is interested with a question, etc. Um, but uh, when we talk about data, what actually are we talking about uh, to this respect? Uh, probably you have seen on the, on the, on the press um, this definition, this statement that data as the new oil. Uh, if uh, uh, we have tried to, you find these in, in, in a number of, you know, um, newspapers uh, like The Economist or Wired, etc. Uh, if you, we, we have tried like to trace back like this definition and we arrived basically in 2006 the definition of Humvee. And I think this is quite relevant also for the work that 
we have carried out on the topic. So uh, what Hamby says is that data is just like crude oil, which is valuable, of course, but is probably valuable if it's refined, so if it can be used in some way. Uh, so, uh, from this point of view, um, I think this is quite relevant for what we are gonna uh, we're gonna try to achieve here uh, with the current paper. I will be clearer on that, you know, later on. Um, another thing that we have done is is, is 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 to have a look at how data is treated uh, within uh, the Fascati manual. We have tackled like the I think it's the last report by by the OCD in 2015. For, for those of you who don't know what the Frascati Manual is, it's basically a report uh, that contains a number of guidelines on uh, the collection of research and development data and how to collect them for surveys, etc. And if you look for data within that, you see that you know there are you know a number of differences there. You know in some parts is included explicitly, but only if data is connected to uh, something more general like algorithms so something that puts data to use there are some remarks in data collection on R&D within the Frascati manual and more recently particularly in this edition there are you know a number of added caveats uh, which recognize the increasing importance of data so even our uh, well-established um, documents such as the Frascati manual, you know, takes into consideration the increasing importance of data as intangible asset and its contribution to uh, research and development and, you know, input of innovation. So um, then, what do we mean by open data, which is like the core topic and the thing that we are interested in? Um, before going into the definition of open data that we um, we adhere to. Uh, I would like, like to have like a brief and quick slide where I would like you know to point uh, uh, to one important thing. So the fact that you know um, there is an increasing importance of openness. So there has been the recognition in in, in the last decades that knowledge openness does not necessarily imply market fa failure, even if it shares you know the characteristics of a public good. And you know there are a number of contextual factors uh, that actually uh, contribute to uh, explain why knowledge openness not, not, does not always lead to market failure. Uh, some of these refer, for example, to the institutional setting, and you can think about, for example, you know, uh, uh, the, the area, the realm where we work on, the one of open science and how openness is actually valued within our work compared, for example, to the world of proprietary technology, such as has been uh, um, discussed and explained extensively by das, das Gupta and David in their 94 paper. Um, similarly, uh, and this probably resonates better with some of the audience today, given that I know that you are working some of you work mainly in, in regional economics, for example, the geographical setting itself and how, you know, um, um, an environment, you know, um, characterized by trust and, you know, knowledge tacitness can uh, actually bring to localized knowledge spillover, which tend to be, you know, remain in localized in geographical areas. And similarly, you know, there has been a tremendous work by uh, economic historians here who have shown that, you know, in history there has been, you know, the industrial setting has been particularly relevant in explaining why uh, openness can actually happen and be profitable. Uh, and of course, there's been you know recent developments in in in, um, in, uh, in the literature of economics and management of innovation, such as you know uh, open source software, university industry collaboration, and the open innovation literature. Okay, now coming to open data. Um, what is open data? What we actually use here in our work is the definition by the Open Data Institute, 2014. Open Data Institute is an organization that has been created and funded, at least initially, by the UK government. Uh, has been created, I think, uh, in 2012, something like that. Um, and uh, it has been basically um, an organization which uh, tries to uh, move forward what has been renamed as the open data movement, and so try to convince governments, 
to uh, release open uh, data is open in, in a good way, so data of good quality, uh, timely data, etc. Um, and it's also had, you know, a huge funding for creating, for example, incubators to be able to create companies which uh, base their business models on open data. And the definition they provide is quite broad in general, and I will read it with you. Uh, information that has been collected by an organization which owns the IP rights, but which is then published online for other organizational entrepreneurs to use freely. And what is uh, quite clear from this general definition is that, you know, data can be open. And, and here we refer to open data uh, with data that can belong to different organizations. It can be government data, it can be, be uh, data belonging to private organizations such as individuals, so user-generated data, private organizations such as companies, non-profit organizations. What we're going to focus here in our work is um, basically only open government data. And why is that? Because right now, uh, from our understanding and knowledge on the topic, open government data is the type of data that is more widespread and is more probably also the most valuable. And it's basically the data that uh, is in the hands and, and the property belongs to governments. And you can think about that, you know, there are a number of examples you can do. Some of these data you probably already use as researchers. And you can think about, for example, example, geospatial data like satellite images, environmental data, health-related data, and so on and so forth. And of course, there are a number of stakeholders involved in the process, governments, of course, but also a community of academics that are pushing very much the importance of open data in the wider community, and also all the advocates such as the Open Data Institute or the Open Data Movement. Now, if you want a timeline of the development of open data, I have provided here um, a timeline uh, provided by Tim Davis. Um, and you, what you will see here is that, you know, uh, there are a lot of information, you know, conveyed by this by these, um, uh, by these timeline. But one important thing, you know, that strikes uh, me is the fact that, you know, if you look at white boxes, these refer to uh, things that happen within the UK. And actually, uh, you, you will see there are a lot of white boxes here. Why is that? Because actually UK has been, you know, an important player in uh, the development of open data through time and in, the, in passing, you know, important legislation, etc. But at the same time, one important stepping stone in this has probably been uh, in the US by Obama's administration, uh, which released this uh, memorandum in uh, 2009. Um, now, um, what we've done, um, well, well, when we start, you know, thinking about, you know, working on this topic, uh, we, we have provided a, a literature review, and that was extremely uh, useful to us, but also extremely easy, because you, you can't find very much in, in, in this literature. Apologies. Um, uh, there is a scant literature uh, where, you know, a lot of contributions coming from computer science where, you know, the main interest in there is about, you know, uh, technological aspects of open data. And there is some work on information management where the main interest is about, you know, open data business models. So how to organize a company so that they can be find, you know, uh, releasing open data freely uh, profitable. Uh, at the same time, if instead you want to look at the topic from a more, um, from a different point of view, uh, there are very few studies and probably the most important one, uh, or at least the one who has uh, ended up in a very prestigious uh, economic journal is uh, the, the contribution by Hughes, Cromwick and Coronado in 2019, which appeared on Journal Economic Perspectives. And what they actually claim uh, is that the value of U.S. government data for um, U.S. businesses is substantial, is important, and is, is increasing through time. Uh, this is actually confirmed by a report by McKinsey in 2013, where they tried to estimate the importance of open data, and they uh, claimed that it is worth more than $3 trillion annually. Um, and, um, pro but probably the most important work that we have solved, which is relevant for our work, is, is the one by Nagaraji, 2016. It's still a working paper, I think, but it's quite a nice one. If you're interested in, in, in the topic, I suggest you to have a look at that. Uh, and it's very specific 
because it looks at the uh, gold discovery industry, so gold mining. And what they look at is basically, you know, they check what happened when uh, satellite programs released freely and available to a large audience, uh, the satellite images. And before days, uh, most of uh, the research and the gold discovery were done by, you know, trial and error, and, you know, by private information, private databases available to companies, and that contain information of the analysis of the soil and the terrain. Basically, but after you know satellite images were released, uh, what happened is that you know what they saw is that you know that the, these brought to an uh, increase in the rate of significant gold discoveries, especially for new companies in regions with strong local institution. And this this really this paper really captured our attention. And what we basically did is try to extend you know to a more um, a broader uh, from a broader perspective you know. Uh, the, the, the insights that we found in this paper. Uh, and the other thing that, that is there is now uh, is, is, is basically uh, a paper that I published together with uh, Franz Uber and Thomas Wainwright in 2019, and it's very qualitative, um, where we basically saw with 20 open data companies interviewed in the UK, uh, which were incubated by the Open Data Institute, and we saw with them about, you know, the opportunities and barriers related to open data. There is also an attempt, but here the data is not particularly, you know, high quality, but, you know, there is room for improvement in there, uh, which is trying to collect firm level evidence about the use of open data uh, by private companies and the supply of open data by government departments in a number of countries. And right now there are four or five countries available and it's called Open Data 500. All right, so uh, what are, uh, if, you, if you trust, uh, you know, me and, you know, you, you actually buy the story that uh, data is increasingly important as an intangible asset that can have, you know, potential benefits and that openness is, has been, you know, seen as also um, a great contributor to, um, to, um, to e economic growth and, 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 and and development, uh, then, you know, um, we are at the stage where, you know, I would like to, you know, um, to discuss about, you know, what are the potential benefits of open data. And there are a number of claims, mainly by OD advocates, such as the Center for Data Innovation or Open Data Movement, that actually open data can bring important benefits to society. And, you know, if you look at these reports and these studies, um, and you try to classify like these potential benefits, uh, you basically find three aggregates there. The first one is uh, social benefits. So open data can improve, for example, public services, uh, which can bring like, social benefits. Um, there can be like political benefits, like better accountability uh, for government through, for example, reduced fraud, um, reduced waste of, uh, I mean, with reduced waste of resources and uh, reduced uh, abuse of power. Uh, at the same time, and this is actually what we are interested in to hear, um, there can be like potential benefits in the economic domain. Um, these potential benefits can accrue to government, but also to the private sector. And you know, on the on the on the side of the private sector, uh, the arguments there you know point in the direction of uh, the possibility by releasing data, open government data, um, to have uh, new good to create new business opportunities. Uh, to cut costs because it's basically a free asset that you provide to potential and would be entrepreneurs and, and firms uh, to provide, you know, um, uh, to provide uh, information on better decision making, for example, for, for these organizations, and also to improve uh, the skill for the skill um, the skills of the workforce. Now, uh, there is also a kind of qualitative evidence about that, you know, I have provided here in like two or three examples of that, that 
just to give you like a tangible idea of how actually open data brought uh, new companies, the creation of new companies, or the, uh, can be seen as the building block of a new venture. Uh, for example, if some of you have recently moved to the UK, well, actually past 10, 10 years, I think, has been actually you know, such a company. Um, but, you know, the services are probably more recent. Anyway, if you have recently moved to the UK or you live in the UK and you plan like to, to change um, to change house, you're probably gonna use um, uh, online engine uh, real estate um, search engine, uh, such as Rightmove or Zoopla. And if you notice within Zoopla, apart from information about the house or the flat that you're looking for, you will have you know a number of complementary type of information, such as data on uh, the crime, uh, transport data, uh, the quality of schools, um, past sales. So you also have, you know, an estimate of the past average price of the house or, you know, average rent. And this is uh, provided to you at a very fine grain level and all of these information basically come from uh, data that have been released openly by government in the past years by the UK government and Zoopla uses this information to provide you know complementary services to the user. Uh, similarly you have like um, a company that, that if I remember well has been incubated within the Open Data Institute in London, Spend Network, which has aggregated uh, information on public spending for more than 300 different public bodies, both in the UK and in Europe. And, you know, it analyzes this information and provides services on public procurement, both for governments and for uh, private companies and so on and so forth and and the other the other qualitative evidence or you know I would say also partially anecdotal evidence that that you you can have here uh, it comes from uh, for example uh, the, uh, the, the the proliferation of uh, open data incubators you have the open data institute I already said you know uh, talked about that you also have for example Udine which has been a six month incubator for open data entrepreneurs across Europe which has been financed um, by uh, Horizon 2020 grant and you have like the survey that I just mentioned about open data 500 which has found evidence of um, uh, an increasing number of open data companies in different countries. Now, um, given this long, I would say, background, but I wanted everyone to be on the same page and to be updated about, you know, what, what, what is meant by open data, what are the potential benefits. So we, what we set forward here are two uh, general research questions. Um, and the first one is that, you know, we select a very sp a specific kind of economic benefit that open data can bring about, which is uh, the creation of uh, new digital companies. Um, the, the level of analysis for us is, is the country level. And what we actually claim is that what we are interested into is to see what is the relationship between the publication of uh, data openly by government uh, and uh, the creation of new digital uh, companies at the country level. Uh, we have the expectation that, you know, this relationship can be like, positive uh, for a number of reasons a number of works that have been you know um, published in, in, in recent in recent 10 years I would say a uh, number of reasons for example the mechanisms be and um, uh, behind that could be um, the fact that um, we have the expectation that um, data, open data can encourage new business opportunities. Uh, is that, for example, this can be like a first step in the foundation of an ecosystem, such as, you know, the creation of ad hoc incubators and aggregators, as we are seeing in the case of Open Data Institute or Dyn, etc. Um, it could be a way to foster collaboration between individuals that then, you know, uh, group together and go on and create companies. Uh, and this resonates also quite well uh, with, you know, recent contribution that talk about the economics of application programming interfaces and the fact that having, having open APIs for companies means higher productivity and higher profitability, particularly for small, uh, small companies and new ventures. 
And then, you know, a, a little too that these are the interface of uh, the interconnection of computer science and economics, uh, which looks at, at the importance in developing new skills by uh, lear via learning by coding, if, you know, new data is made available, or, and also um, evidence uh, on the benefits that code spillovers can bring to the economy as a whole. So, and this leads us to believe that uh, there actually can be like a, a sort of positive correlation between um, open data, open government data, and new digital companies. And the second one is actually uh, that we have the expectation that uh, the quality of government uh, should play an important role here, because it's just not, you know, the publication of data is open, which should matter. But it's probably, you know, um, the uh, the type of data that is uh, published, uh, and also a number of characteristics that, uh, particularly, um, new businesses um, see as really important. And this comes really much from the qualitative work that we have done in interviewing um, OD entrepreneurs in our uh, previous work. And a number of things, you know, came out, you know, quite strikingly, and it's uh, that, you know, uh, these these people, they were not really, these entrepreneurs, they were not really particularly interested into uh, having the data freely available, but, you know, having, you know, reliability of the source, so the quality of data mattered for them, you know, the timeliness, so uh, whether, you know, there were frequent updates of the data and whether the source was available, was expected to be available in the future. And so if uh, the level of uncertainty was low to this respect. And all of these things, they point them to a strict relationship they had for with government officials. And one thing that they keep on, you know, um, pointing out in these interviews is that you know uh, the quality of these official the quality of the department so the quality of the institutions matters a lot to this respect and so uh, this leads us basically to ask our uh, to our second research question which is uh, to which is whether you know the quality of institutions moderates the relationship between open data and new venture creation so this is like the, um, I would say, the theoretical part. And, you know, just to make a recap, we have basically two main research questions. One is that, you know, we want to look whether there is a correlation between uh, and possibly an impact between open data, uh, open government data and, you know, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial index of uh, at the country level and whether, you know, the quality of government, the quality of institutions uh, positively moderates this, this relationship. So with this in mind, we aggregated a um, uh, number of data sources together. And of all these data sources, uh, some of them are quite, you know, established data sources in the analysis of um, entrepreneurship at the country level. Uh, probably the new data source that we use is this Open Data Barometer score. I will go through the details of that. Um, and, but this is also, you know, probably the novelty of our work because we focus specifically on this because it gives us a score of um, open data at the country level. But this is also a major constraint. Why is that? Because this forces us to have a very short panel, four years, 2013, 2016, uh, 87 countries. For the good thing is that for 62 of these countries, we observe um, them, we observe 62 of these countries in at least three time periods. So it's quasi balanced kind of uh, panel, even if it's short. Uh, the methods that we employ, we basically estimate, you know, uh, these two um, regression models. The first one for the first research question, and the second one with the interaction between OD and institutional quality for the, for the second research question. And you know, from an estimation strategy point of view, uh, we are aware of a number of trade-offs that we are facing. And given the trade-offs that we are facing, we decided to provide as results all the results from uh, different estimation strategies because we believe that they have pros and cons each one of them. Okay, we start from a baseline model, a pooled OLS, ordinarily square with cluster standard errors at the country level. Then we move on and we also provide random effects 
model uh, due, uh, given that we have expectation on the efficiency loss of a within estimator which is such as short panel because we don't give countries enough time to uh, develop you know within variation and this is also part from our uh, descriptive statistics. We also provide the within estimator is horrible, the result there. And this is something, the only thing that we are not, you know, happy about, you know, about our paper. We'll show them to you in a second. Um, we provide also results for the between estimator because there are a number of um, applied empirical works that show that between estimator in the case of measurement error uh, could be a good way like to solve, you know, measurement or to, to lower, you know, measurement error. And this is particularly relevant for us because we have information on the country level data that is, you know, aggregated. Uh, we uh, finally provide uh, an hybrid uh, in the baseline regressions, hybrid approach where we try to bring together um, both within and random effects models uh, in the same in the same regression. Francesco, 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 yeah. can you hear me? Yes, I can. There's a, a hopefully a spotlight question of clar clarification from from Ricardo. Ricardo, go ahead. You know, if you want to pose the question yourself, please go ahead. Just oh, I, I put on on the chat, but. The economic freedom index is the one produced by the Heritage Foundation. Mm. The economic freedom index. That's a good question. I should double check it. Because if it's the one I know, uh -huh. it's like it. ideologically biased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but don't worry. Those are only controls. Yeah, but I wouldn't use it if it is the one I mean. Okay. Right? Yeah. Right. If it's if it's gonna be sort of like I published I published uh, uh, one month ago. If you want, you, you can read on Economia e Politica oh. a short article on the on the bias by the uh, think tanks from the conservative, uh, let's say from 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 the, from the from the extreme right. Mm -hmm. uh, or the the impact that they have on on the economic uh, on, on on the economic profession. And it's quite huge. So I would be well, uh, uh, pay attention to what you're using. If it is, is the one I mean, I mean, I don't know if it's I mean, uh, simple. Well, I, I Economic that. freedom to me means Heritage Foundation. Heritage Foundation means uh, uh, trouble. Makes, uh, the, the <laughs> right. I, so ideology. That, uh, uh, it's going to be sort of discussion on that. Let us uh, but I just stop it. It was just a clarification. Yeah, yeah. Let us postpone the discussion on that, Ricardo, which is for sure very important and interesting. But uh, that's, let us not stop the flow. No, no, but uh, stop here. Stop here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just... But we can we can return on that later on in, in the yeah, discussion. Yeah. But thanks for that. Okay. Go Thank ahead. you. Thank you again. Uh, okay. Uh, so hybrid approach, and, and finally, you know, we have a number of robustness checks. Uh, one of these is actually, you know, um, the most important one, and is the one that I'm going to present uh, the results of, which refers to instrumental variable estimation for uh, pos possible problems of indigeneity. Um, I will go come back to that in in a second. Uh, so, in terms of our um, variables, our main dependent variable is the JDI uh, index. A fantastic, fantastic acronym, I would say. Um, global Entrepreneurship Index from the Global Entrepreneurship and Development Institute, JDI. Uh, as you probably, Ricardo, you can appreciate here, we have been very careful in motivating the, the adoption of the dependent variable and our main explanatory variables. We have been less careful probably on our controls, as you, you know, probably correctly you know, uh, pointed out, uh, but, you know, we will certainly double check that. Uh, so the dependent variable is the JDI index. Um, uh, this is a measure that is developed annually and measures the quality and the scale of an entrepreneurial process through four, 14 different pillars, which are aggregated on three levels, the entrepreneurial attitudes, abilities, and aspirations. We believe that this has a number of advantages compared to another popular index, the GEM, is Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. Uh, why is that? Uh, first of all, the sample size, which is quite relevant for us because we have a very short you know, time period available due to the, the short time span of uh, that we measure the open data score. Um, and so we want to maximize our sample size to this respect. And you know, uh, the JDI has 130 countries compared to 50 for the GEM. Um, 
it has you know a quite important academic and policy relevance it has been a number you know a huge number of studies and also has been adopted by policy makers to take informed decisions on um, policies to spur entrepreneurship at the country level uh, the sample and the methodology seems more stable through time compared to the gem and another important thing and this is why when we talk about entrepreneurship uh, we are very careful or we try to be careful when we talk mainly about digital entrepreneurship in this case because actually the way this index is constructed is that it's giving higher weight to high value uh, added, uh, added industries for example and sectors and so from this point of view uh, you will find the top of the ranking for this index countries that you know tend to make investment and to have a rate of creation of new ventures that are very high value, high value added which is uh, mainly digital companies so overall is an index that we would say that um, measures uh, entrepreneurship with high potential uh, I knew that um, in this presentation I had to provide some maps given that uh, this uh, I mean there are a lot of that there is an audience that you know expects you know um, maps given that they work in regional economics etc yeah. we do appreciate that huh? we do appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> So I did my best, and this is basically the geographical distribution for our estimating sample of the Global Entrepreneurship uh, Index. And as I just mentioned uh, before, you know, dark, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, uh, countries uh, with, with uh, I mean, the usual suspects of, uh, um, of, you know, high level of digital entrepreneurship are in there. And you will see the darker regions are actually countries with, you know, high levels of, uh, that are expected to have high level of digital companies. Um, explanatory variable open data is probably the, the newest and, and the most interesting variable that we adopt. We adopt the open data barometer score by the World Wide Web Foundation, which has done, I think, a tremendous uh, effort in, in this data collection. Um, we read carefully all the re uh, reports and the methodology that they provide in this data collection, and I think uh, we think that is very well done. Um, what they basically do is like they, they have three different types of data collection. Uh, what we refer main here is to this one, the peer-reviewed expert survey, uh, because this contributes uh, to uh, one of the sub-indexes that is the, actually the one that we use as our main variable, OG implementation, while the other ones, government self-assessment and security data, um, goes into the other two sub-indexes mainly. And we are not very happy with that. Why is that? Because the other two sub-indexes compared to OG implementation have inside measures or quantities uh, that you know correlate very highly also with our um, dependent variable. And so to avoid you know to create a measurement error that induce uh, induce um, endo endogeneity in our estimates, we selected we selected mainly all the implementation. And what does all the implementation do? It basically you know provides a uh, detailed assessment of the data sets available and you know the quality of these data uh, along a number of dimensions uh, for each country and this is basically filled by uh, expert national experts which uh, not only uh, investigate the data sets available by governments but they also interact with government officials to this respect so this is the full list of the 15 different data sets that um, that uh, are are um, are basically analyzed and are included in, in the open data score. And the other good thing uh, is, is here I have a number of examples. For example, have a look at the mapping data. These are basically the guidelines provided by the national expert who need to survey uh, this information. And what, for example, they are expected are minimum thresholds such as detailed digital map of the country provided by a national mapping agency with a minimum level of scale. Uh, etc and the same thing for others and you know they also need to provide a detailed assessment of whether the data exists and you know if it's in machine readable format if there are bulk, bulk downloads available and all of this information is basically aggregated together in a very i would say sophisticated way and you know these three sub indexes are built and as i mentioned for the information that i just mentioned about the different data types this goes into the old implementation which is the score that we actually adopt then we have a number of uh, robustness check to this respect this is the geographical distribution of the open data score and what 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 is interesting to me from this map 
and is actually that you know darker regions means higher value of open data score at the country level and what is interesting here is that there are usual aspects so as i said you know at the forefront of this movement there are uk and us obviously but there are also other countries that are not the usual aspect that seem to have you know quite a good and high value of open data and this actually makes sense it makes sense because from the interviews that we had from the knowledge that we have you know collected uh, by working on this project we are aware that uh, these actually countries like brazil but uh, we, here we are talking about before uh, bolsonaro uh, but anyway you know uh, brazil and mexico uh, have done a tremendous effort in improving uh, you know uh, open data uh, for example one of our co-authors alan ponta is originally from mexico and he was able to come to the uk and do a phd in web science because the government, the Mexican government, were giving you know scholarships for studying all specifically open data topics in uh, in uh, in a foreign PhD. Uh, so well, makes sense. That's the final point. Institutional quality. We uh, really refer to um, a consolidated literature here, uh, which uses World Bank worldwide governance governance indicators. Uh, this information is actually aggregated in six main pillars, such as political stability, regulatory quality control of corruption we use in our estimates control of corruption why is that because it's basically the one that is widely used and the other reason is that, that all these measures are highly correlated between each other between 0 0.7 and 0 0.9 so they point very much in the same direction in terms of a proxy for institutional quality government quality at the country level and we have also a number of robustness checks in this respect uh, institutional quality, here the, the geographical distribution of institutional quality across countries. Now, controls, um, uh, yeah, we actually use a lot of uh, economic freedom index, so um, probably Ricardo will not be, be very happy about that, you know, but what we have done actually in the selection of these controls, I need to go back because it has been quite some time uh, since I, I, I checked, you know, um, uh, the data set that we have used here. Uh, actually, you know, compared to the other, you know, uh, entrepreneurship index and the Jedi and the open data. But what we have done at the time uh, is that we have survey, we have provided a thorough survey of the literature of uh, that tries to explain the determinants, the antecedents of entrepreneurship at the country level. There is a rich literature about that. And we have been very careful in selecting um, um, the variables and the, the data sources of this, this literature. Uh, and so from this point of view, I mean, all of these variables and the data source, if I remember well, you know, refer very closely to the, the measures that have been found in the previous literature matter for entrepreneurship at the country level. So results. I have a mix of results. So I have the results from the regressions, but before that I have a number of graphical results. So GDI and open data. If you look at the bivariate correlation from a visual point of view, what you will see here, uh, we have basically provided the map of Jedi as we have sh I've shown uh, you at the beginning uh, by you know shading different colors to different countries. At the same time, I have added these frame rectangles, which basically show you the level of your Discord uh, for each country. On this one is the US. Apologies, it ended up here because I made the average, and probably there are a way uh, which basically bring you know uh, the frame rectangle here compared to the other countries that are well well placed but you know trust me this is the the us part and you would what you notice from here is that you know uh, um, the uh, the fuller uh, of blue the rectangle is uh, and 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 then um, and more likely it, it is that you know this the, the country where the rectangle is uh, is uh, a country with a high value of um, entrepreneurship. So uh, there is also some some preliminary um, bivariate evidence on the relationship between the two things. And this is also part of from our standard you know, scatter plot, where we basically uh, plot the different countries by UD score, entrepreneurship score, and you see that there is a nice, you know, positively um, uh, steep curve here, line actually. When we bring on board institutional quality, what we add to, our, to the previous graph is basically, it's the same thing here now, the only thing, the frame rectangle, the, the thickness of the frame rectangle uh, tells you uh, the level of institutional quality for that country. And you will see here that, you know, the thicker the rectangle, uh, 
the, the, the full uh, is, uh, is the frame rectangle in terms of higher level of open data and you know higher is the entrepreneurship index. Same thing comes from this uh, scatter plot where we basically show that uh, for high level of institutional quality, so the green, the green squares, here, uh, it looks like that uh, the correlation between OD score and entrepreneurship score is steeper compared to the other lines. Now, results. So these are the results of our regression. Here we have all the controls that I mentioned before, uh, and then our only report for the sake of exposition, the, the main results. And as, uh, as you can see, you can appreciate from here, you know, we have, you know, we always find some significant and positive correlation between open data and, and the entrepreneurship index, apart from the fixed effects where, you know, the coefficient drops heavily. Uh, the institutional quality looks, uh, you know, positively correlative and when we control for, for that and all the, you know, turns out to be uh, significant and positive in all cases. The nice and interesting thing is that when we use an hybrid approach, it tries like to bring together uh, the benefits of uh, within estimation and between estimation, we find, you know, significant and positive, you know, we retain some significance also for the within estimator. When we introduce uh, institutional quality, interaction with institutional quality, we find that the interaction terms significant and positive in all cases, which is nice to us as a result. The direct effect of OD seems to be negative, but this is, you know, the case in which institutional quality is zero, which is really uh, never the case. In the indicator, if I remember well, we have also, I haven't provided here the graph uh, for the results, but, you know, but very, you know, um, low value of institutional quality, uh, in, in, in the overall effect of OD turns, uh, turns, on, turns positive. Robustness checks, so I want to spend the last minutes before, you know, going to them. I still have like eight minutes or something, right? Sandro? Yeah, yes, Samir, uh, maybe something less than eight, but yeah, no, no more than eight. I Okay. <laughs> All right, then if you want the details about the instrumental variable, you know, we can discuss them uh, later. Uh, endogeneity. Uh, we have expectation, obviously, that, you know, uh, these are country level information. Our fixed, our within estimation is not really, you know, behaving quite well in that respect. And there are a lot of theoretical expectation on the fact that, you know, there might be an endogeneity issue mainly driven by omitted variable bias, probably, in our estimates. One example can be that the demand for open data is higher in countries with a more digitally literate population, which is something that uh, we can't uh, control right now, and this would probably be correlated both with open data and with our entrepreneurship index. What we do here is basically we resort to uh, a um, uh, different data source, the World Value Survey, which is um, a well-established and well-rounded uh, data collection on cultural data at the country level, which is representative of country population. Um, from, the, from this, what we do is we select two variables, which to us um, are expected in given our reasoning uh, are expected to be correlated to open data, but not be correlated to uh, and the entrepreneurship level of the country. One is open-mindedness, uh, we rename it, and the other is voice. Uh, I can go into the details of that, you know, um, uh, during the discussion, if you want. Uh, I probably don't have the time, you know, uh, to show you how we define them. What we do is that we, we, we take a two-stage least squared approach, similar results obtained when we use a two-step GMM or a limited information maximum likelihood um, method for estimation of the IV. The other nice thing I believe that we do uh, is that uh, we, in, we also implement as a robustness check a lasso regression. Uh, because in the end, in this literature, in this nascent literature, in the application of machine learning algorithms to regression analysis, one of the claims is actually, you know, the selection of instrumental variable is actually a, predi a prediction problem after all. And um, what basically LASSO does in one, 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 one sentence is it, it estimates a prediction error by adding a penalization term. Okay, and uh, by using these penalization terms, 
uh, it eliminates the variable that contribute little to the fit. So you have a large number of instrumental variables. You want to select, you know, a smaller sample of those. Uh, this lasso regression approach through machine learning is quite useful to that to that respect. It's a machine learning algorithm basically because it, in, in a machine learning style, it adopts a cross validation by partitioning the sample in different sample and see uh, and and try to maximize the prediction. Um, or minimize the, the, the prediction error in this case. So we start with 11 potential instruments with, you know, makes sense from a theoretical point of view from the world value survey. And we end up uh, with uh, four, if I remember well, potential instruments. And the good thing is that the lasso approach, uh, uh, also within the four that are, you know, identified by the lasso approach, we find, the, you know, uh, also open-mindedness and voice. So the one that we're selecting more from a theoretical point of view. We estimate, you know, that the robustness check with three popular approaches to instrument selection in LASSO and, you know, all the results you know, go in the same direction. And here I will show you basically, you know, the, the results only for, for open-mindedness and voice. As you can see, uh, both, this is the first stage, uh, both open-mindedness and IV voice, you know, go in the same direction, um, uh, either when they are, you know, put separately or together. Uh, the, I would say that the statistics, you know, the overall statistics, the fit, uh, the fit statistics from the first stage are, are, are behave quite nicely. Uh, the other thing is that we have also um, uh, similar results are also obtained when we instrument the interactions. Um, so OD times institutional quality with open mind times institutional quality and uh, and voice uh, times institutional quality as suggested as you know not the most uh, correct uh, approach um, but still you know one approach that should be should be checked as suggested by Burridge in 2010 under uh, the assumption that institutional quality is exogenous exogenous. This is our outcome equation, and what we actually obtain and, and find here is with a reduced sample because we lose some information due to the lack of data for some countries, and, and in, uh, for some countries, uh, the fact that uh, we have a nice, uh, a nice, you know, significance for the GDI, the direct effect of the GDI in, uh, of OD on the GDI index, and also the interaction with institutional quality. We have also carried out a number of other robustness checks. I can go through them, you know, if some of the questions, you know, um, um, that you make in, in the Q&A session, you know, bring this uh, forward. Concluding remarks, just to, to conclude. Uh, what we have done here is, is, is basically trying to have a look at OD as a raw material or to empirically test the claim that OD can be seen, open data can be seen as the raw material for entrepreneurship in the digital age. Um, and what we find is that OD seems to be positive related to digital entrepreneurship and that this relationship is mainly uh, a difference, you know, between countries also or, um, probably as an artifact of our, of our sample itself that is very short panel and that government quality contributes to this positive relationship. Of course, there are a number of limitations that I'm sure you will not um, uh, we will not uh, lose the opportunity to highlight uh, in the, in the Q&A session. We are aware of them and we are trying to work in, in one direction or the other, try to overcome them. Uh, from a policy perspective point of view, the thing that uh, I don't have the time to spend time on this, but you know, uh, I would like just to highlight one important fact that you know, our, our results seem to go in the direction that has been uh, mentioned and highlighted by recent contributions, uh, such as the fact that probably if actually data, open data, uh, has a positive uh, impact for the society, also in terms of the creation of new digital companies, probably, you know, uh, um, legislation in terms of, uh, by assuring, of course, protection of privacy, but creating incentives for individuals or um, private companies to release the data they have uh, as freely and openly available can be a win-win for the economy. I'd like to finish my, my presentation with a quote. Thanks very much for your attention. In this case, John Bozek, creator of XML specification. I want my data back. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, Francesco. Uh, very, very well done. Uh, it was really an interesting topic, uh, which uh, is interesting for, for many reasons. Uh, 
uh, I don't know whether you know that at, at the GSSI, we are ourselves in, involved in, in different open data projects uh, with the idea of supporting a particular case of entrepreneurship, I don't know where it could be called like that, which is very, very construction of L'Aquila after the earthquake, right? So this, this is this open data reconstruzione, open data for L'Aquila. I mean, if you want to have a look at that, it's actually a case that you might be want to I mean, much more local than the uh, country level you're addressing, but uh, relevant relevant for us, okay? Now, having said that, let me try this. Uh, you know which sound is this? This is coffee time. So, oh, okay. <laughs> this is coffee time, so I've just found on the web uh, the uh, coffee sound. So we are going to take... Uh, uh, at not more than seven, eight minutes for a virtual coffee break. So we're gonna back uh, at 11, 20, not later than that, okay? Seven, eight minutes for a short coffee break. And then we return back. If someone wanna post a request of intervention in the chat, please start do it. And once we will be back, I will be happy to uh, leave you a word and, and post your question directly to Francesco. Thank you, Francesco. Relax a little bit and then we will be back soon. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Talk to you soon.
Right, although maybe earlier than, than foreseen, I'm back just to remind you, if, if some of you is already back, if you have questions to pose, just drop me a line in the chat so that I can organize the questions for you. I've already taken requests from Alberto Marzucchi, from Roberto Antonietti, from Claudio Ghisetti. Um, well, I don't know whether someone else has a question to pose. Interesting opportunity to have uh, Francesco here in addressing your questions. So don't be shy. We will be glad to pose your question to Francesco. And also, Daniele, I don't know whether you are there. If there are questions from the YouTube channel, we have had some people watching the presentation in streaming. If someone posed a question, uh, no questions so far, Daniele says from, uh, from YouTube, never mind. We're going to have questions from here. But overall, I think that Francesco, you were able to have a uh, lot of followers and 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 quite <laughs> quite good audience. I'm, I'm very it's important in this digital. I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm very pleased. I am. I'm very, I'm very pleased. That's really an important topic. Um, also nowadays, in COVID in COVID times, there's a lot of debate about how open data should be. And, and I think this is another question we might want to discuss. Right. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, but of course, uh, given that I'm a... Uh, well, if I can, sorry? If I can uh, do an open request, give me ideas for a quasi or experimental setting for testing this. <laughs> right. So, so there's, there's a request from Francesco to us, or to all that are present. Exactly ideas for having a, an experiment or a quasi experiment on that if someone has got an ideas but yep. uh i don't know uh maybe that we can start um not really collecting but but posing question uh i don't know whether alberto marzucchi from spru uk is already connected and if you want to start posing a question though alberto is there go ahead alberto i'm ready can you hear me yeah we yep. can we can okay cool cool i'm not showing my video because i'm like mattarella i'm in need of an haircut so yeah <laughs> <laughs> here, here alberto don't worry yeah, yeah but you've got a beautiful bookshelf which increases <laughs> the credibility no i don't have the bookshelf so. no uh, jokes apart thanks a lot for the presentation it was really nice and i think it's already a super well developed paper so I'll try to be, I mean, I'm asking a clarification rather than um, pointing to mistakes that are, I've not spotted. And by the way, if I've got a, a, a quasi-experimental idea, I'll keep it for myself. Um, <laughs> Talking no. about open data. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, the, the, the question I have, Francesco, is like, uh, uh, can you provide a little bit more clarification for your JEDI, nice, nice acronym, uh, um, index? Because my point is, is it, I mean, is it capturing digital entrepreneurship or is it only, is it captured mainly uh, digital entrepreneurship? Is it, is it putting more weight on digital entrepreneurship? And, uh, and based on that, I'm, I'm going to tell you why I'm asking this. Uh, okay, so uh, first part of the so, question yeah. and then we'll see whether there will yeah. be a follow-up. A follow yeah, okay. mm -hmm. yeah um, well, our understanding of the indicator and this like post probably a subjective kind of understanding that we provide that uh, I provided in the slide is that you know uh, we believe that is capturing uh, um, high value type of uh, new companies okay so being them digital companies or companies where you know um, belonging to other sectors 
that's an open open issue and is not clear from from the index itself it's a very complicated and composite index uh, that captures you know a number of different dimensions okay mm -hmm. um, but in, in the end also from our reading of you know papers that employ the same indicator and our reading of the methodology employed which you know I, I don't remember it if, you yeah, know yeah. totally right now uh, this, uh, it gives our this impression also from having a look at the geographical distribution of countries as I show you in the map okay yeah. normally normally uh, for example the world bank index for entrepreneurship which is basically the new, i think it's, it's something simpler like the number of new companies you know i might be wrong here if you uh, provide a geographical map of that you what you will see is basically that you know uh, the countries at the top of the ranking are like you know uh, developing countries mainly why is that because um, there is a population of low value-added uh, companies and sectors that you know uh, have a lot of companies that are creating there mm. uh, that's why we give this uh, interpretation all right yeah, but to me this is uh, I, I, sorry uh, sandra if i can I'm yeah yeah you, 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 yeah you can go ahead uh, Berto. yeah, yeah. Uh, the the reason why i'm asking this is because obviously you've got a story and the story is uh open data feeds into entrepreneurship high value entrepreneurship in particular digital entrepreneurship as a sort of intangible uh, input okay or oh, actually an input in there you don't see them doing the inverted comma thing uh uh sort of in the in their production function uh so the the idea is the following so if you're not able to to convince us that this is really digital entrepreneurship then i may say okay actually francesco is looking more at the story of a country where there is a lot of political attention a lot of policy support to entrepreneurship in general and so the mechanism at play may be different if you see what i mean mm -hmm. so i mean then your indicator would be a proxy for some sort of i don't know in the uk huge amount of support to entrepreneurship in general but if i look at the guy who's basically repairing cars down the corner he is an entrepreneur but he's actually doing nothing with with open data so that's the point i mean i would like to see a little bit more support to this idea that, that your your variable is looking capturing in particular digital entrepreneurship because that's the that's your story i think no, no, no. I, I perfectly agree with you so we try to do a little bit more in the paper but probably so to that respect, you know, our robustness check in that direction can be a good idea. So finding an indicator that really um, pins down, you know, mm. uh, effect of OD on digital entrepreneurship and digital companies as well. Yeah, maybe, like restricting, maybe, the, yeah maybe restricting the sample to countries where you have a more direct measure and then you can check whether the, the, the mechanism at play is still there uh, when you use yeah, as a variable. Yeah, it's a lot because of our sample. As you've seen, you know, we yeah. don't have a lot of country your observation because of the short panel. Probably now we can do a bit better because there are, uh, I think, one or two years of the OD score that came out. So we can extend in that direction and then uh, do what, what, what you suggest in terms of restricting the sample to a number of countries uh, on which we have, you know, a very specific and clear, you know, uh, measure of digital entrepreneurship. I will write this down. Thanks for the feedback. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Sandro. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. That was actually a question that I wouldn't like to pose myself, to which extent that entrepreneurship index is uh, truly digital. So as far as understood, this is, is to some extent black box. So this is something that um, maybe should be recognized more, more clearly. But having said that, I think that Roberto Antonietti, University of Padua, can... Are you there, Roberto? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead with your question. I'm pleased to have right. you here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. What a, what a trip for a, from a guy from Reggio Emilia to one from Modena. So <laughs> you have to pay attention, Francesco, to these questions. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so thanks for the very interesting presentation. Uh, I also think that the paper is almost there and um, it's rather convincing. Uh, I have three spots, uh, requests of clarification and nothing nothing else the first um i uh, didn't understand which type of institution did you use from wgi control of corruption uh okay why not regulatory quality i also uh, well yeah uh, do you have any other questions then i will show you the slide yeah, yeah. Be, 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 uh, okay be, be, yeah, be, so, yeah. 
Yeah, we, you, yes. you take all the okay. questions and then we reply okay. to the questions. Okay. Okay. okay, very shortly. The second, um, I was wondering whether an alternative to this lasso technique was to use a principal component analysis for extracting one single component from all the instrumental values that you have provided that they are correlated. I don't know. Uh, so in this way, you can keep everything together in a sense rather than selecting, but uh, I know you, you, you know the, your data. And the third is more theoretical, um, but it's more related to the literature rather than, uh, than uh, your, your data. And uh, uh, I was wondering from, more, from a more, let's say, general equilibrium perspective, uh, whether, okay, you show that uh, entrepreneurship, digital or not, is stimulated. But uh, is there evidence, or do you have evidence of a possible substitution effect with incumbent entrepreneurs or employees? So do you have an idea of a net of the net effect, whether it is positive or negative or zero in a country, uh, or whether there is a transformation of competencies from employees to self-employees, mm -hmm. or something like that, a kind of entrepreneurship dynamics? Uh, uh, related to, to, to open data. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Roberto. Uh, I think that, Francesco, you can try to cover Roberto's question if you if you can. Yeah, yeah I would like to. Um, let me just you know, show you, given that I have done. Um, let me just. As I have prepared them, you know, it is worth using them now what I did I did a screenshot okay um, <laughs> um, concerning the um, thanks very much Roberto for the for the questions uh, raise I think relevant issues here um, so I have a number of backup slides uh, um, and one of these uh, backup slides no I don't have the results themselves they are in the paper but I have uh, yeah sorry and now we should be able to see that. Um, one of the, the things that we carefully check in a number of robustness checks is exactly this institutional quality measure that we adopt. As I mentioned, you know, in our main regressions, we use um, control of corruption because they are very high, highly correlated with World Bank uh, um, World Governance indicators. But at the same time, we do a number of other things. So uh, we use all the VGI and institutional quality measures one by one. Results are identical, basically. Uh, we use an average of the different variables, which is used in some, in some applied words as well. And not only given that we, we went to our workshop where we received you know, harsh feedback on this, uh, probably it was an institutional economist, the guy, well, it certainly was. Uh, and he suggested us to use different data set because he was not happy with the World Bank one, even if it's thoroughly used. And so what we did is we use, um, we, we build, we use institutional profile database that is an alternative database measuring institutional quality to a very detailed level point of view. We build institutional quality variables from there and, you know, results are, are still there. So no matter how we measure uh, how we measure institutional quality with different data sets or different measures, you know, um, our core results are, are still there and significant. And, and this should take care of the, uh, of the first question. Unfortunately, I will not be uh, so exhaustive on the other two, <laughs> but at least I had like some backup here. So PCA instead of LASSO. Um, well, we use lasso because it's uh, it's cool, no? right? You know, there were a lot of because it's trendy, yeah. <laughs> it's trendy. Uh, PCA. Uh, we haven't checked the correlation between the different instrumental, the eleven instrumental variables that we identify. We are not sure that they are so highly correlated between them. We can try the PCA. Um, it's a, it could be one way to go, so it can be a further robustness check with this respect. But LASSO is already a robustness check of a endogeneity test, I would say. Uh, we can have an additional one that can make, you know, the, the, the certainly the, uh, the paper more robust. Thanks. So the analysis is more robust. Thanks for your for uh, for your question. Uh, now coming to the third uh, to the third question. So you are. Uh, let me let me uh, let me just understand this better. So you are worried that uh, we, by not controlling a substitution effect in the publication of data is open, 
a substitution effect between entrepreneurs and you know employed people basically we are kind of you know introducing uh, uh, some bias in our estimates i would not i can't imagine in which direction no no, no francesco is much simpler uh, okay. simpler and um, if, if you it's, it's more a policy implication uh, i okay. mean uh, um, okay, you find that there is uh, OD stimulates uh, uh, entrepreneurship, but on the other hand, is there evidence? O OD is a kind of it's a form of technology innovation, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can also think about a potential displacement effect, perhaps in some public administrations or in some firms, some kinds of employees are displaced. So is there evidence about that, the, the labor market effect of OD, as far as you know? We don't, we don't have uh, evidence about that. It might be interesting maybe to include an employment, unemployment rate measure at the country level. I don't know if these can... Yes, it, it can work, yeah. It would be a substitution, like moving from, one, from being self-employed to employed, but at least you, know, you can capture partially unemployment effect, direct unemployment effect, right? Right, right. Uh, is, is that okay, Roberto? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, now it's uh, Claudia Ghisetti turn, University Catholic of Milan or Bergamo, depending on whether you look at the job or, or non-job residence. Claudia, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Glad to see you. <laughs> Glad to see you too. Thank you, everybody, for thank you, Francesco, for, for the presentation and GSSI for from letting me hear about it. Um, I have to admit that I have a bias in uh, when whenever I see composite indicator, uh, as I have been working on composite indicator, I have this uh, this problem of uh, willing to to understand a bit more what's behind them. Uh, and if I I think uh, about your presentation, I have nothing against it because of course it was very interesting and uh, I'm not. Um, uh, showing any um, relevant point pertaining to your main results. Uh, but I still have some doubts about the way you, you use this control variable on the Global Innovation Index and the Global Competitiveness Report. So let's say that it is a minor question because it's not affecting the main results, but still I'm posing it because I still have it in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I understand it correctly, but as, uh, if I see the way the GDI is constructed, it covers many pillars. Uh, some of them are the technology absorption, the product innovation, uh, the process innovation, but also the competition. So conceptually, uh, if the GDI index is capturing many pillars, including innovation and including competition, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder why you need to control for the Global Innovation Index and the Global Competitiveness uh, Report as explanatory variable because it I see the GDI as the measure of entrepreneurship plus innovation plus competitiveness. Then I don't really see uh, the added value of uh, having the, the other two composite indicators as explanatory. So I, I may be uh, mistaken. I'm, I might be mistaken, but uh, I want to hear your opinion about it. <laughs> Thanks very much, Claudia. Yeah, it's very very well placed question. Uh, I don't like composite indicators as well, but this is what was available at the time when we had, you know, some some research questions at the country level. I also not used to work at the country level with country level data. I mean, the one that know me, they know that I work mainly with micro micro data. So it was also a challenge, I would say, for for us to work on this. And I I fully agree with you that you know. Composite indicators in Jedi, in particular, include some things that we are then also control on the right hand part of the equation. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if these these suffice to answer your question. You know, um, I have shown you some you know uh, bivariate kind of correlation. The correlation is still there even if we don't control for for these. Um, and the other thing uh, that is somehow uh, I would say related to to what you say. Um, is, uh, is a robustness check that I just want to mention, somehow related, it's not fully related to what you say, but I take the opportunity to, to, to show this because I think it's, it's quite nice from that point of view. It's basically, you know, one of the measurement errors that we try to take into consideration is uh, um, the control for the overlap between open data and institutional quality. And what we basically do is we, we, we do a regression of OD on institutional quality, we take the residual and we plug it in within the equation as the OD measure. And we do this because we want to 
uh, cleans uh, OD from any institutional quality kind of uh, measures and uh, leftovers in there, and the results hold in that case as well. So we have tried we have tried to do you know some attempts to uh, uh, to control for probably measurement errors that come mainly from the composite indication and the level of analysis. Uh, probably with the JEDI, we are a bit short in terms of options there. One of the things that we have done is we have used an, another um, another um, another uh, measure, the GEM. Uh, but you know there is a very uh, low number of observation in that in that kind of indicator. But the results more or less go in the same direction. We lose some significance uh, in our in our estimates, but still you know uh, the the results are are, are as expected. And, and the last thing that we did is also we tried the three main uh, sub indexes of the Jedi to see to which of these three uh, OD seems to be more uh, related. And if I remember well, it, it, it's not included in the paper, this, uh, what we actually notice is that uh, it mainly refers to entrepreneurial opportunities. That was also our expectation, the fact that you release data for open to the public, it brings, you know, new opportunities to would-be entrepreneurs. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Answer your question just partially. No, 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 it's uh, fully, you're fully answering to, to the question and uh, you convinced me totally. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Claudia, are you happy with that? Yeah. I'm super happy with that. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. So any any other question from the floor? So from, from the virtual floor, of course. Is there any 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 other question that you would like to pose to Francesco? Don't miss this opportunity. Uh what what we wait for other question. I might pose some question myself. Uh well, Francesco is really uh, a terrific job is very advanced uh, in terms of methodology arguments and so on and so forth as as it has emerged from the discussion uh, you 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 did a very good work in dealing with with composite stuff that you have a different levels in your paper you get a number of composite indicators as as claudia as rice, then you have also composite units of analysis, which, you know, for ourselves, uh, uh, the social science GSSIs is, is always quite worrisome. So, um, the third question is not really a question about your paper, but possibly about future development of this paper, right? So, um, is there any data available to address this kind of issue at a more disaggregated level of analysis in spatial terms. You are, you are dealing with, with countries, right? So, and, and you did a very good job in dealing with countries, but uh, I mean, no, no need to say that countries are very heterogeneous within themselves, especially in terms of entrepreneurship, right? Entrepreneurship is an extremely local, local fact. So I'm wondering whether there are some venues to explore and, and to deal with this issue uh, with a more disaggregated level of spatial analysis. This is actually my first question. I don't know whether you want to address it uh, right now or you want me to add some more questions. Uh, oh, I can, I can you know, address this right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So our plan is to go to the micro level. <clears throat> uh, we have a plan for that, uh, but it's still not that satisfactory, I would say. Uh, because the data, the, the data available is, 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 is still quite full and needs a lot of training and, you know, um, and also uh, it must be linked to other uh, data sets available. And, you know, the main data source, I just presented it, it's freely available on the internet. So if some of you are interested in doing some, some kind of work in this respect and join the team, more than welcome and it comes from the od 500 open data 500 is a survey that has been launched in the uk uh, five or six years ago and it's a sort of partnership and consortium and uh, now and it has been done in at least five or six countries italy included what is the main issue about this data source at the micro level that you know they didn't have really a statistical approach so it's not representative of you know companies, for example, at the country level, uh, which means that there are a number of issues that to look into to take into consideration if you want to use this micro level data. The other thing is that you only have information about open data and the name of the company itself, and you have mm -hmm. to, be able to link this information to 
uh, company registry at the country level for the country that you're interested or if you are interested in more countries you know they have to link it to the other countries as well so a lot of work but you know there is room probably to at least say something at a more disaggregated level i don't know though if this is possible at the spatial level at the geographical level because you are incurring you know a double problem also of representativeness at the at the geographical level yeah yeah yeah, but, but um, I think that, yeah, trying to scaling down the the research question could help for not only in retaining uh, spatial heterogeneity in that, but also, you know, in getting closer to your 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 research uh, question, as, as Alberto was pointing out before, I think that in order to convince us about the argument, you might need some more, you know, micro evidence in particular. I will be more convinced if you are able to tell me that open data helps more than non-open data with entrepreneurship, right? So that will be very convincing to me. Uh, and then I know whether, yeah, you will need to, to definitely go at a more micro level in order to uh, address this issue. And, and then uh, still in terms of composite stuff, you have a lot of composite indicators. Uh, I'm not a fan either of those composite indicators, but but uh, in particular because I'm afraid that you get a lot of confounding effects. Uh, one one you, you you rightly pointed out that that quality institutions actually institutions of quality, for example, uh, um, could be related to open data, and and open data could affect quality institutions vice versa rather than being a moderating uh, uh, factor simply as you put it right so you you were able to control for that as you said before but i'm afraid that a lot of other uh, 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 factors of this kind could be entailed by the very uh, synthetic natures of these indicators and 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 i think that if you could able uh, following again alberto's suggestion to to disaggregate uh, a bit more this this synthetic indicators uh, uh this this confounding effects could be possibly attenuated but uh yeah this is not just the question about a comment i don't know whether you want to reply on that uh yes um well i can say that, that we were worried very much about open data score and the indicator because it was actually the new things that we were br we are bringing like to the community i would say um and so we have been very extremely careful. So one of the robustness checks that I mentioned before, it's about, you know, uh, these uh, confounding effect of institutional, between institutional quality and then yeah, yeah. now try to tackle that. But the other thing that we did is actually, you know, we were quite lucky because there was a sort of competition between different institutions in development of an open data indicator. And there is another indicator that's called Global Open Data Index, which is freely available. And we also use that one, which has, different and less reliable to our eyes uh, kind of methodological approach in building the indicator itself. But if we use that one instead of our open data barometer score, the results hold exactly you know, the same results we obtain. Similarly, another thing that we do like to uh, try to control for these confounding effects is and something that we do is we use only a sub-index of the open data score as a right. your implementation, which is very, very, scientific from a certain point of view because you have a list of databases you expect this list of databases to be available uh, in government in the different countries you rate them we know very strictly and detailed kind of guidelines you take you know certain boxes and you build that sub index and so this is like the most kind of scientific thing that you could think about about, uh, about open data so all the implementation of course there were instead another and uh, other sub indexes that, that relate more to the impact of open data ready uh, statements for government officials and we know we, we get you know read of these and we just use all the implementation but even if we put the three sub indexes together and we use the overall index developed by the world wide web foundation results are still there so from that point yeah. of view, in terms of the measurement error of all this score we are quite sure that you know there's something going on there then there can be confounding effects that we are not able to control for and what we yeah. how do we try to address this instrumental variable and the robustness check that we did yeah, yeah, yeah. If, we, if you provide me with an experimental setting, oh, we, have yeah, an idea. Yeah. we have an idea for an experimental setting, though. And I can tell you, you know, if, if you want to, I mean, I don't care. <laughs> you don't care. You want to you wanna be open on that. Maybe yeah. you can tell yeah. us later. Well, I think it is not that good. 
uh, I've also uh, received um, a request by Anna D'Ambrosio. Uh, I don't know whether Anna from Polytechnic of Turin is uh, still there. Anna, are you there or, or shall I go ahead and read the question myself? Anna? She might have might to go. Have. No, she has, she has hello, gone. Hello. hello, hi. Oh, you're there, Anna. Sorry, right. sorry. My, my connection is very bad. So. <laughs> you you, you, you want to try? Yeah, just wanted to um, to uh, you know uh, restate something that was actually already in some previous questions, but I think that uh, uh, it would help very much clarifying your uh, underlying mechanism if you could uh, tell the effect, the impact of OD on the relative importance of virtual versus non-virtual entrepreneurship. Mm. So. Uh, uh, whether to understand, uh, for instance, whether OD provide uh, new sources of entrepreneurship, new markets, somehow new consumers, or whether it is uh, rather a, an enabling technology that affects uh, uh, more thoroughly all kinds of entrepreneurship. That's just uh, an additional comment, I would say. Well, uh, thanks very much, Anna, for, for your question. Um, uh, I think uh, this is relevant, and you're, you, you're right, I think, when you point out that this relates quite closely to some of the questions, in particular the one from Alberto at the beginning, probably. And I agree that that would be great to be able to understand uh, whether it's entrepreneurship, it's if OD helps more virtual or digital entrepreneurship compared to non-digital one. Um, from our anecdotal evidence coming from interviews and our reading of the literature, talking to people, entrepreneurs, uh, government officials as well in, uh, in the different projects that we had uh, while at the University of Southampton, much of the discourse was going towards uh, digital entrepreneurship. But we don't have evidence about that and right now uh, we can probably test this. Uh, we probably should need, like, you know, to do something more in the line that Alberto was suggesting and having maybe a subsample of countries for which we are able to build an indicator on digital entrepreneurship and see what happens. Or, you know, another way to go is the one suggested by Sandro to go at the micro level and at least that respect test whether adoption of OD uh, is different for. Uh, for uh, digital versus non-digital companies, or companies belonging to different sectors, for example. Uh, and that's that's the best, you know, that I can think about, you know, right, I think of right now. I don't know if you have uh, any further, you know, suggestions to this respect, that, that would be, those would be more than welcome. Thank you. Right, all right. So any any other question from, from the floor? We are approaching the, uh, we still have 10 minutes time to go, so, if you are willing to stay and a bit more and posing question, uh, we can actually exploit these further 10 minutes. Uh, I had a, already had the chance to uh, to talk a little bit about that with Francesco some days ago about uh, open data in COVID times. Now, nowadays, this is a this is a question that is in terms of comment that you can't avoid in any webinar. <laughs> Irres irrespectively from from the issue you are addressing you're gonna have a question I know, I know, I know. About COVID. so uh how, how do you see it now there, there's a lot of of calls for opening data also in terms in terms of of, of patterns this is not an issue disclosing past patterns but given you are also an expert of pattern data uh would, would you mind just to give us your personal uh, feeling about this story. I mean, just just to, you know to open up and, and widen the discussion and involve maybe some other in the talk. Well, this is this is a question that one should expect nowadays, but a question for which I'm completely unprepared for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the topic is so complex that you know probably it's not only about you know the data being open or not in this case, but you know um, there's a lot of complexity in in this. What I can actually say is that, uh, from, from, from personal experience, from what I've seen, read, and you know, followed, um, what I can just tell is that, you know, um, and, and, and if I want to try like, to also point to, to our core results, um, I mean, even in the case of, of COVID, uh, I would say that, uh, that, that you know, uh, it's a matter of not only having the data 
open and freely available so that everyone can scrutinize them you know okay provided that you you uh, take out the problem of privacy to that respect but it's a matter of also how the government quality in this case matters a lot you know yeah. we have seen and we have witnessed yeah. This yeah. Cross huge differences across countries to these yeah. the countries that are being more open and also the quality of the data themselves and the way the way they have collected the data which is probably the major problem right yeah right? is yeah. the data collection itself do you trust this data i mean yeah. we are all aware of you know the main limitation of this and the fact that you know probably in some respect in italy we haven't done you know enough tests and we are not doing them particularly in certain areas that were mostly affected while in other countries that have been, you know, uh, quite well prepared from the beginning, and they have been well prepared because they have been, you know, the, the institutional capital probably needed. You know, think about South Korea, but given given also the experience that they had in the past with other similar strands of the viruses, yeah. that's yeah. the only thing that I can say. But it's very, very yeah, yeah, and uh, and, and, and I think the data about COVID uh, diffusion is is a question at stake. I think. I mean, the data themselves about the widespread of, of, of a disease, a number of deaths. This is something that, uh, in principle, uh, should should be open. And 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 I've been working with that uh, with with Alessandro Palma and Andrea Scania. I don't know whether the two of them are there, and Alessandro Pagian as well. And what we are facing is actually that that those uh, supposedly open data are not that open. But I mean, th th that's that's another issue, right? Uh, so. Any any other question? If if there are no question, uh, uh, I think that we can uh, start thanking again, uh, Francesco. It was really uh, a big pleasure to have you here. Uh, we were very much interested by by by, by your topic and by your talk. Uh, so uh, we hope to have you maybe in L'Aquila in person in future. Hopefully not really in a in a webby format uh, and before oh, at the beginning right before all the covid outbreak right yeah 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 <laughs> indeed indeed uh, so to conclude i hope you don't mind if uh, uh, francesco you can, if you can stop your presentation i would i okay. would present i would present something myself uh, just just one second. Uh, Davide said, thanks, Francesco, and thanks, Sandro. Thanks to you, Davide Consoli. It was really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, just to, can you, can you see my, 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 my sketch, my video? Can you see it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So this is just to tell you that we are at the fifth seminar with Francesco, but we're going to have more. So next Thursday, the 21st of May, from uh, 3.30 to 7.30, we will be honored to have Mark Patrick here. I, I, I think that Mark Patrick does, does not really need any presentation. He's really a top scholar in the field of regional studies. So, and he's going to talk about a very hot topic, COVID-19 and the implosion of regional economics. So, uh, if you're interested, please uh, come back and we'll be happy to have you again. Then uh, these are Vieta seminars, Tuesday 26, Sami Moisiu from Finland, talking about ge geopolitics of a knowledge-based economy. Then we're going to have Thursday 20A uh, from, from, from Hong Kong, uh, June 1, talking about the social speciality of Uberba Creative First, a Chinese perspective, which is very timely in these times. And then uh, the last three really top scholar in regional economics, economic geography, Simona Yamarino, the 4th of June, uh, Phil McCann, uh, the 9th of June, and Andres Rodriguez Pose, the 12th of June. Uh, this is not going to be the very last uh, webinar of a series because uh, we're going to carry on, given the success of the series as in counter up to now. We have been having a lot of people participating, so we decided uh, not to stop it there but rather keeping on, uh, although with a lower frequency. Uh, but I mean, uh, I'll, I'll let, uh, until uh, the 12th of June, we, you have actually uh, food for four to come, okay? So uh, it was really a pleasure, guys, uh, and I uh, wish you all the best, and I hope to see you soon in person, and in case also in one of these web occasions, okay? Thank you very much, guys. Hello. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Ciao. Ciao a tutti, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Arrivederci, grazie. Ciao. Ciao Francesco, ciao Sandro. Ciao, ciao, grazie a tutti. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.